This is truly a wonderful gathering, and it's great to see uh, all of you here, but it's great to see so many fellows, current and former, back in, this, in their familiar stomping grounds, this wonderful library. Welcome to the 72nd annual meeting of the John Carter Brown Library Associates. My name is Bill Twadell. I'm the current chairman of the group. It's a great pleasure to have you all here today. I just referred to the Jamboree participants, but the associates from our neighborhood, the wonderful staff of this wonderful organization, uh, friends and others. The, we are here to honor this lengthy legacy and to make reference to last year's participation of the association in the operation of the library. And we're here to introduce the next chapter of the association's significant contributions to the library's mission. First, a reminder of that mission, that purpose. It was to help the library acquire Americana source material, to sponsor related exhibitions, and to do occasional publications regarding their holdings. The core functions continue today, along with the obvious addition of preservation of these invaluable objects. But very importantly, in 1962, the library inaugurated the Research Fellowship Program. It uh, has been another another avenue for the associates to be of use because our association funds at least one and this current year four special study uh, portfolios, those that are not restricted by endowment and this is a particularly valuable opening to the scholars in the community. I mentioned the four, they come from Indiana, Paris, Tuscany, and one from Harvard. Uh, we also made acquisitions over the last year, and we will have notification or description of those available. But let me pivot to that flourishing fellowship program and its remarkable record of scholarship and discovery. It is comprised of an annual cohort of 40 or so, uh, and right now we are approaching the 1,000 mark of alumni of this program that's been going for 53 years. That is a monumental achievement. That is the tangible use of these remarkable instruments of knowledge by people who can benefit most and can spread the wisdom with their knowledge and, and perceptions. Uh, a year ago, Neil seized on the idea of drawing together these two powerful international, uh, institutional streams, the associates and the fellows. The resulting combined body is intended to celebrate and support the, collaborative, the collaboration of rare book lovers and those who can appreciate and extract from the contents of these invaluable books, new knowledge, and insight. It is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Professor Matthew Restall. Matthew, as you will appreciate in a moment when you hear him speak, is a genuine Atlanticist. He graduated, he got his BA from Oxford, his master's and PhD from the University of California, he now teaches at Pennsylvania State University. He is a specialist in the Yucatan and Mexico and a prolific author. Importantly, among his other distinctions, Matthew is a longtime member of the Associates and he is a recidivist fellow. Thank you, Bill. I didn't know you were going to say things about me that wasn't necessary at all. And you probably are now thinking, oh no, we're going to have to sit here and listen to this guy giving some kind of a lecture. We're not here for him. So don't worry, I'm not going to. All I'm going to do is say that I'm honored and thrilled to have an opportunity to be able to give something back to the library 
that I love, that we all love. After all, it is our love of the library, the building, the books, the people that brings us here. So I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to work with and communicate with all of you and the many hundreds of other former and future fellows and present and future associates and friends of the library. Um, I look forward to seeing the association grow and flourish along with the library, and I know that's going to happen, not because of the efforts of Bill and me, uh, but because of the commitment of all of you, and also because we now have a dynamic, energetic, visionary, young, new director and librarian of the John Carter Brown Library. And it, he's about to speak to us now. He's the reason why we're here. And I was, ju I was just wondering that myself, getting a little nervous. I think he got lost during the photograph. Um, so please uh, give it up, uh, not for the last time, I hope, Neil Sophia. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and fellows, members of the Brown University and Providence communities, governors and associates of the library, good evening and welcome. It's a pleasure, and it's particularly moving pleasure, to stand before you tonight to reflect on the past and future of what was once John Carter Brown's private library, and today to honor what has become one of the greatest collections in the world of its kind. Its greatness lies not only in the books that line its shelves, but also, and perhaps especially, in the communities that have formed around them. This three-day reunion and jamboree is a celebration of that community and the many constituencies which comprise it. Normally, at the annual associates meeting, as many of you know, a leading scholar lectures on a subject that lies within the scope of the library's collection. I'm going to ask you to indulge me tonight in a different kind of presentation, one that sheds light not on where we have been, but rather on where we might be going. As part of this celebratory moment, then, I would like to employ the library's own past as a springboard to looking toward its future. And I'd like, you to ask, uh, I'd like to ask that you join me as I do. We're all familiar with the JCB's unofficial motto, speak to the past and it shall teach thee. As a matter of fact, all of you passed by that motto as you walked both out of the library for the picture and came back into the library in the marble, uh, marble alcove and entryway. 80, 80 years later, after it was originally uh, placed on that alcove in uh, 1910, it was inscribed and chiseled onto the library's facade on George Street, serving as a reminder to all who walk by, perhaps even as a provocation, that to study the past is to learn from it. But there is also an implied duty that acquiring such knowledge demands to share it with a larger audience. Why else would we inscribe such a statement on the library's public face? For although the JCB is a private library on the campus of a private university, its vocation is firmly and unassailably public, like most great American institutions that have emerged from private holdings. So the question is, how does the library share its access to the past, and with whom? And how do we maintain a focus on cutting edge scholarship while expanding the institution's reach to those whose cultural patrimony we guard and preserve, namely the inhabitants of all the Americas? In the past several years, if not decades, major cultural institutions the world over have been grappling precisely with this question of access. And in doing so, they've been reexamining their fundamental missions. In particular, in light of changed circumstances and new mandates, they've been asking themselves who their 21st century audiences are or might be, how new forms of communication can help to reach them, and what tools are useful to carrying out their historical missions in new and engaging ways. 
Someone intimately associated with the JCB undertook a similar path 45 years ago when he transformed the National Gallery in Washington into one of the world's leading art museums. This, of course, was J. Carter Brown, whose bust over there reminds us that this library is a monument to the Brown family's generosity and to its public service in equal measure. How did Carter accomplish such a transformation? One way was to bring in new audiences and to refocus the mission of the institution around those audiences and not dumbing things down or being condescending in the process. Carter Brown's story is not just relevant for museums, of course, but to libraries as well. It's now possible to connect special collections with a new generation of students and scholars. It is now possible not only to have readers and researchers walk through the library's doors, but to invite historians and historical aficionados the world over to share in our collections remotely. My reflections tonight, then, are meant to focus our attention on what my predecessor, librarian George Parker Winship, called the peculiar and special purpose of the JCB. This talk, in fact, is organized around a double centennial anniversary. The publication of the library's first official history in December of 1914, and George Parker Winship's departure as the JCB's first official librarian 100 years ago this very day. Winship was instrumental in redefining the library's function when it passed under the care of Brown University. He not only managed a physical move, he also managed a conceptual move as the library went from private to institutional status. His duty was to maintain the library as the leading repository in the field of Americana, even as he merged his role as JCB librarian with that of scholar and researcher. He was, in the words of one of the library's, library's earliest reports, a man of thorough technical training and exceptional bibliographic instincts, and his legacy hangs over the institution even today in countless ways. Many of the values that Winship espoused are evident in the history of the library he produced. The John Carter Brown Library, a history published by the Marymount Press in December 1914, became one of the most significant monuments to his time as librarian. Winship was the first to memorialize the history of the library in narrative rather than bibliographic form. His 97-page text provided a snapshot of the library's development at the time and a blueprint for the century that followed. He began with a description of an extraordinarily bibliophilic family and their earliest purchases, which included a Boston imprint from 1729, written by Judge Samuel Sewell of the Salem Witch Trial fame, as well as a copy of the English Pilot, containing texts on West Indian navigation and referencing the river Amazons for that reason alone, very dear to my own heart. He continued with short and engaging chapters on the collector, John Carter Brown himself, and his earliest purchases from Henry Stevens in 1846 and 1847. He later went on to describe the catalog produced by John Russell Bartlett, John Carter Brown's first librarian and a talented bibliographer who had had an earlier incarnation as an ethnographer and surveyor, among other disparate careers. The transition was the next chapter in which he discussed Sophia Augusta Brown, John Carter Brown's spouse and later widow, and her engaged and exceedingly refined selection of new texts for the library, as well as her insistence that her sons regard their father's library as the most precious of their possessions, never forgetting to uphold its prestige and, and preeminence. Another chapter describes the donor, in which Winship discussed the energy that John Nicholas Brown put into building up his father's collection and ensuring that a dignified and permanent home would be found for it. We then come to the building, in which Winship describes in painstaking detail the characteristics of the building in which we now find ourselves, its furnishings as well as its functionality. 
The next chapter deals with the institution, in which Winship discusses very interestingly the idea that each library in Providence was considered part of the resources of the community as a whole, what Winship called a spirit of community interest. Next goes on to describe the publications in which, was, in which he discussed facsimile editions and other bibliographical publications to finally end with the work of the library itself, in which Winship discussed the day-to-day -day activities of the library staff, their support of scholarly questions, the library's relationship to the campus and Providence communities, and the social events and activities undertaken by the librarian. I have looked and surprisingly, there is no mention that the library ever put on a jamboree in its earliest years. <laughs> I know that will surprise you. Um, I should also say that Winship's history, uh, produced in 1914, was written explicitly to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the founding of Brown University, just as this year, as we commemorate the 100th anniversary of Winship's history, we are also celebrating the 250th uh, anniversary of Brown uh, University's founding. Um, in fact, we have been celebrating the uh, 250th anniversary so much that we have a joke around here uh, at the JCB that it always seems to be 1764. But that is another question. In writing the history then, Winship performed a service for the JCB that was congruent with the needs of the university. And in doing so, he formed a symbiotic model for cooperation and participation where both institutions would benefit. Winship, pictured here at the original location of John Carter Brown's library on 357 Benefit Street, was originally hired on the 1st of May, 1895, 20 years to the day before his departure, that is 120 years ago, accepting the position as librarian to John Nicholas Brown, John Carter Brown's son, pictured in the painting uh, above me. But if the Massachusetts boy was expecting providentially smooth sailing in the service of the Rhode Island family, he was mistaken. Five years following Winship's appointment, again to the very day, a momentous event rattled the residents at 357 Benefit. This was the death of John Nicholas Brown, John Carter's son, and the series of events leading to the library being given to Brown University, effective May 23rd, 1901, which was the date in which uh, John, uh, John Nicholas's Brown estate was settled. Once the details were ironed out, the indenture indicated that a building was to be constructed on the campus of the university and that the lot and building shall be devoted solely to the reception, preservation, maintenance, and use of the said Biblioteca Americana. It was understood to be a special library, uh, entirely separate from any other library of any kind, general or departmental. It was determined for memorial purposes that the library be visible and in a conspicuous position that would enable every visitor to the city to easily survey its outlines, perceive its significance, and appreciate its great value. There were also incidental but weighty practical advantages to its location. Heating would be provided centrally. The university's janitors would be able to do work without constructing a separate janitor's quarters and the university's security officers would make the use of a special night watchman unnecessary. As many of you know, the building was dedicated in 1904 with a four-year-old John Nicholas Brown, at John Nicholas Brown, present to hand the university administration the keys. From that moment onward, as the renowned historian Frederick Jackson Turner memorialized in his 1904 dedication address, the John Carter Brown Collection of Americana was confided to the care of Brown University, and the advantages of a special relationship between the library and the university came clearly into view. As Winship looked on during Turner's speech, halfway through the two-decade tenure that he would enjoy as librarian, he heard Turner extol the jewels of John Carter Brown's collection one by one. Turner emphasized that collectors like the Brown family are great public benefactors, since the collection was open to the use of all who could show good right to use it. 
In this, the Brown family joined the Astors, the Carnegies, the Morgans, and the Huntingtons, and paved the way for the book collectors, bibliophiles, and associates that have supported this library so generously throughout its history. The second of Turner's observations was the intelligence of placing the library in the bosom of Brown University, which, as I mentioned earlier, conferred both physical and symbolic advantages upon the collection. The important point here is that the transferal to Brown was never a fait accompli. Rather, this was a pragmatic decision on the part of John Nicholas's Brown's executors and agreed upon by the family and ratified by the university administration. It was understood then as now that the pluses of close proximity to a major university would redound to the benefit of both institutions. The third equally important element, indeed the crucial stroke of genius, was that the university conferred upon the library a largely autonomous status, what Turner called the dignity of independence. Coming from Turner, one of the most influential US historians of his time, the use of the term independence would have resonated deeply, especially in reference to a collection of Americana. Unlike the Lennox collection, eventually fused into the New York Public Library, and in a sense, the John, John Carter Brown's uh, true competitor in the period when he was putting together his collection, or Harvard's Houghton Library as an example, the JCB would accrue notoriety for its own sake, contributing to the university community because of its unique reputation, and not merely because of its physical presence on the campus of the nation's seventh oldest university. The subsequent century from Winship's day to our own saw the solidification of the JCB status amidst a relatively stable yet ever-changing panorama of directors, curatorial staff, new books and maps, new research fellows, a new wing, and the list goes on. But the circumstances of the last 20 years in particular have forced us to re-examine the earliest mission of the institution, that which was forged during uh, the age of Winship and his peers. This new reality requires us not only to speak to the past and to hear the past's wisdom, but to speak to the future as well. And that is what I would like to spend the rest of my time discussing. So how are we currently addressing the present and future challenges? In the first instance, we have invited into the library a series of specialists who can help us to position the institution favorably for new opportunities. An extraordinary cast of advisors has met with virtually all segments of the library's various constituencies basically over the past 12 months. I should, in particular, thank the fellows who have been in residence this year for very generously giving of their time to assist us in assessing the library's strengths and weaknesses. This is one of the fantastic things about this institution, and I'm thrilled to be able to say this in front of so many fellows, current and former, that they jump to the, uh, to the call for any kind of help that the library needs because they appreciate so much what the library does, and that has absolutely been the case of, uh, over the course of the last 12 months. The Board of Governors has also been directly involved in setting out critical mission priorities for the library, directions that we will be discussing in collectively in the days, weeks, and months ahead. This will allow us to develop a set of pillars, critical goals and values of the institution that have always been implied but not always explicitly stated throughout much of the library's history. So what do I expect these pillars and priorities to be? Here are a few that I would imagine will be part of its horizon. The first watchword is integration. That is, ensuring that all the activities that we support, or at least most of them, are interconnected and supportive of the JCB's larger institutional mission. The JCB has, uh, over the course of its history, served as a backdrop for some of the most important scholarly activities in its ample yet very focused field, uh, often with landmark publications following suit. As a scholarly research center, it has always brought together the best scholars under the best conditions, working individually on the most path-breaking projects. 
I strongly believe, however, that the library can profitably sponsor a research agenda of its own without diminishing its support for individual research. And it can do this through thematically oriented fellowships, opportunities for collaborative research, and integrated programming that ties these initiatives together. And we've begun a lot of these uh, initiatives this year, including some in environmental history, in indigenous studies, uh, and history of the book. And in the coming year, we'll be exploring similar pilot in initiatives focused around the Americas in a global context, the age of revolutions, and the history of scientific travel. In fact, many of the themes that have been discussed this afternoon and that will be discussed in the fantastic program uh, that awaits those of you who are able to join us tomorrow. We've opened calls for interdisciplinary cluster fellowships. That is, where a group of scholars come to the library to work together side by side on a particular theme, text, or project transforming the JCB into something akin to a laboratory for humanistic research. We've also supported collaborative grants with Brown faculty and graduate students, and the outpouring of interest for this particular initiative has been incredibly inspiring. Uh, these smaller grants have gone, for example, to an archaeologist who is looking at objects that traverse geographical space along a north-south axis in the Americas and who will be putting on programming that will benefit the JCB community as well as the community at Brown more broadly. We also uh, gave a fellowship to a graduate student in art history working on an exhibition moving tropical environments between continents. Another grant supports faculty members in Portuguese and Brazilian studies and history working on entangled histories of empire. Another, an advanced Brown undergraduate conducting cartographic research on indigenous names and naming during King Philip's War. And finally, a faculty working group that is developing an annotated bibliography of the JCB's Asia Pacific collection, including Hawaii, the Philippines, South Pacific, Southeast Asia, China, and Japan. I personally have been thrilled to see all of these different constituencies coming into the library and finding the engagement of the Brown community on topics that are directly related to the broader mission of the institution. And I, as a matter of fact, uh, a week ago, we had uh, in this very room a gathering of about 100 uh, scholars and students from the newly formed Institute at Brown for Environment and Society, talking about the relevance of historical and present day scholarship to questions of, um, of environment, of climate change, and taking advantage uh, in this very room of the fabulous exhibit exhibition that we have currently on subterranean worlds, mining in the colonial Americas. We plan to do this over the course of the next four years on themes that will be run, running parallel to what the Institute at Brown Environment Society is working on as well. So we're also doing a very interesting integrative work in the realm of acquisitions. Uh, for the past year and a half, we have started to explore how our acquisitions policies can support scholarly research in new ways, while adding to the richness and depth of our collection. And I just wanted to give uh, two examples of, of works that we purchased that seem to speak to that. One here shown in its digital format, because we don't have the, uh, the item in our collection yet, is, uh, was acquired at the New York Antiquarian Book Fair only recently, and it is William Gilbert's The Hurricane, a Theosophical and Western Eclogue. This is a text that argues mystically and somewhat elliptically that there was a causal link between the American Revolution and the importation of African slaves to North America, focusing on the scenery and torrid ambiance of Antigua. Um, it will be showcased next year when we hold the second of our four environmentally focused exhibit, uh, exhibitions on the, th the theme of air. This is earth, we're gonna do air, then fire, then water, and as I usually say, then collapse. <laughs> uh, alongside this exhibition, we are currently planning a symposium entitled A Traveler's Air that will bring scholars of travel literature together with historians of environmental thought. 
that is, the air we breathe and the airs we hear. So air becomes then uh, something that can uh, bring about pathogens, music, or radical ideas. And a well-placed addition to our collection can help catalyze a conversation between literary scholars, historians of the revolutionary era, and perhaps even a few confused meteorologists. Another book we purchased last June from a Paris bookseller is entitled Histoire de Loango, Kakongo et Autres Royaumes d'Afrique. This text belongs to a category we might call unrecognized Americana. These are texts that refer primarily to other parts of the world, usually involving history and travel, that have never been understood to contain content about the Americas, but they most certainly do. This Histoire de Loango, for instance, discusses a kind of potato quite similar to those that are cultivated in our American colonies, and goes on to refer to the coconut tree found in Africa as a species that Europeans transported from America to Africa. This speaks to an area of perennial scholarly interest for the JCB, which is America's influence on the rest of the world. And here we can think of Sir John Eliot's important work on the old world and the new. So the relationship between knowledge produced in the Americas uh, that, and sent to Africa, or vice versa, is actually of unquestionable relevance for a library uh, of Americana. And here is another unrecognized resource from which our fellows can benefit. We're also trying, and this is, this is uh, significant, to push out more information on our acquisitions as they come into the library through new, uh, new media and encouraging fellows and people in the community to be able to take advantage of what we, what we have. We're not going, only going to be acquiring books, we will be producing books as well. And I'm thrilled that Joyce Chaplin is, uh, is here this evening because she and I are going to be the editors of a new Oxford University Press series entitled Nova Americana, which will renew the library's commitment to investigating the integration of the Americas into the rest of, of the world. As editors, we will be encouraging scholars to make new connections with other oceans and other continents taking inspiration uh, from the history of science, environmental history, and other relevant subfields. New genres might take advantage of parallel digitization projects, including in initiatives already represented at the library, like the Archive of Early American Images or Internet uh, Archive. And this is really part of a larger project to interrogate the word, the single word that is inscribed above the doorway coming into the library, Americana. What it was when the library first came into being, what it has been over the course of the library's history, and how we might understand it today from our 21st century uh, vantage point. Digitization is, of course, another key pillar of the library's future. And on this, George Parker Winship had some interesting things to say, not on digitization but you'll see what I mean. Uh, he wrote that the original photostat machine that was present in the library in the earliest years of the 20th century represented the latest and most radical extension of the library's activities, consistent with the library's policy of supplying photographic copies of books and rendering the utmost service to scholarship consistent with the preservation of these books. Always taking advantage of the latest technologies, the library's formal program to digitize the collection got off the ground in 2009, when former director Ted Widmer and board member David Rumsey, here present, pushed for an open access licensing agreement between the JCB and Internet Archive. I will admit that had I been director at the time, I might not have made the same decision. But I also am very clear that in retrospect, that was the correct decision to make. We are now making daily progress toward digitizing and uploading the materials from our collection, thanks to our imaging staff and dedicated scanners and cameras downstairs. We're in the process of going fully open access, a program that we will also be announcing in short order. The benefits of open access, as many of you know, are that they allow anyone, regardless of geographical or economic limitations, to gain access to the library's cultural patrimony. 
Some may argue that this diminishes the value of a collection like this, um, painstakingly acquired and preserved over the course of more than 170 years, but I think they would be wrong to argue in that way. Far from diminishing the value of the library's collection, open access exalts it. The world's greatest museums and repositories have embraced this view, including the Rijksmuseum, the Getty Collection, and the Folger Shakespeare Library. As Alice Schreier has recently written on the subject of expanding digital access, she is a librarian at the University of Chicago, our initial concerns that digital surrogates might diminish interests in originals didn't last very long. Digitization is fast becoming an expectation, not an add-on luxury. And uh, uh, institutions that are vainly trying to hold on to the images in their collection recognize that it is an effort that is futile at best and a colossal waste of everyone's efforts at worst. I think the aim should be to put our materials to the widest and most distinguished use. We're building the digital library today for universal benefit just as John Carter Brown built his Biblioteca Americana in the 19th century. And I feel particularly fortunate that the Board of Governors of this library has been uh, incredibly committed to this project, and I think they should be applauded for pushing us firmly in this direction. And I would especially like to signal David Rumsey's generosity and leadership in moving us along this path. There are, of course, costs associated to open access, and cultural institutions are grappling with this as well. In practical terms, the library stands to lose approximately $25,000 per year of its annual income by making all of our previously digitized images freely available to the scholarly community for private consultation or publication without cost, non-commercial non publication, I should say. At the same time, it costs us approximately $60,000 a year to keep the digitization machine going, something that was not historically a line item on the budget of the JCB or any other institution for that matter. We're launching a plan, however, to make digitization possible by allowing former and current fellows, associates, and other interested party to move materials that they want to have digitized into the digitization queue thus allowing them, which is to say you, to help the opportunity to help shape our digitization goals and priorities at the same time. We are still working on the tax implications of all of this, but the, um, but the hope is that in fact it will be understood to be an entirely tax deductible donation to the library, in my non-lawyerly opinion, the same way that somebody who is an urban dweller living near an important uh, public park, giving money to that park but enjoying the profits of st strolling through the park on the weekend would not be seen as taking uh, due, undue advantage of that. Um, and I want to give you an example. Uh, this is actually an example of, uh, you'll see in a moment, a digitized version, an example of one text that was recently digitized um, and sponsored for digitization by somebody who was sitting in that chair uh, just about 40 minutes ago. Um, this is a text that is near and dear to my heart. It is one of the texts that uh, was formed the foundation of one of the chapters of my dissertation and then, uh, and then book. And I um, donated some money so that this could be digitized. And I also donated some money so that I could get this very beautifully designed digital book plate designed by the best book designer uh, in the United States, Mark Argetsinger. Uh, and we are, going to be, uh, we are going to be offering this possibility for those of you who have a particular object in the collection a, that you would like digitized, and B, that you would like to be associated with. Um, this is a gift uh, for, from us to David Rumsey, one of his favorite objects that has this digital book plate inscribed in it. So anytime anybody now downloads these digital objects, those uh, digital book plates will be part of, of that. Uh, here are some of the digital book plates that are, this is very much in the beta mode. We have one uh, that will eventually be generated, uh, uh, digitized through the generous assistance from the John Carter Brown Fellows class of 2001-2002. Ooh, that includes me. 
Got to get to work on that. Um, and the one on the right, as you can see, is actually, it's possible to, uh, to sponsor a book plate in the name of somebody else. This one in particular, in honor of George Parker Winship, JCB Library in 1895 to 1915. And the remarkable thing is that these digital objects, like all digital objects, function at scale. So if you uh, go, if you focus in on this, you will see this image, in fact. So it goes from very far to very close, and, uh, and it's very, very exciting. The other um, fundamental uh, pillar that we're working on is really the pillar of outreach. Um, and on the subject of digital projects, we uh, received a grant from the NEH uh, earlier this year to help us to push our exhibitions out to a much larger audience than those who are fortunate enough to come into this spectacular reading room. So we're currently on, uh, at work on that, trying to rethink our traditional display cases, employ new exhibition technologies in situ and online, and have a formal and informal conversation about the library's materials. One of those informal conversations took place about a month ago at the opening of this exhibit around a manuscript that is actually over there in the a display case. <clears throat> it is uh, the Medidas de Minas y Beneficio de los Metales según Gamboa, uh, where we had a conversation around a recently acquired manuscript with fellows, uh, Brown faculty members, and other invited guests trying to bring this new uh, material into the wi widest use possible. And so it doesn't uh, get acquired by the institution and sit on the shelf until uh, somebody happens to find it in the digital catalog. Um, we're also rethinking uh, space in the library, as you may have noticed, for uh, those of you who are familiar with the two tables being on either side. Um, the orientation and layout of the reading room has changed. Uh, in addition to providing better security for the collection and what we hope to be a more intimate research environment for our fellows and researchers, not to mention a good place to put food during receptions, uh, we've effectively divided the room into two distinct areas. One reserved for advanced scholarly research, the other toward public engagement through exhibitions and eventually through publications about the library. And we'll hopefully be putting together a mini library of exhibition catalogs and other uh, uh, publications of the library that people can come in and learn something about the collection. Um, we don't expect throngs of tourists to come through the doors, but, uh, and we're ill-suited to receive them, uh, but I do think <clears throat> that when visitors do come through the doors, they should not be turned away by an inhospitable glance or a sense that they are unwelcome. Rather, they should be instructed about the collection, shown our exhibitions, and be allowed to speak with hushed voices to the past. As Winship wrote in 1914, the fostering of historical studies has not been found inconsistent with the cultivation of a friendly interest among those who enter the library because it is a pleasant place to visit. In those days, according to Winship, the library offered strangers passing by a comfortable seat to rest in and something to look at, at, uh, at the, in the exhibition cases. Um, I wouldn't say that this is a particularly ringing endorsement for the power or potential of public exhibition space, but many of the world's leading institutions are moving in exactly this direction. Think of the British Library, for those of you who have been, the new Boston Public Library, or the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Whether we do this through an inviting exhibition or an iPhone self-guided tour with headphones remains to be seen. But the fortress model is now obsolete. That is really the conclusion. Uh, what is more, as a world-class resource on a university campus, it becomes far easier with this configuration to welcome undergraduates and graduate students to our weekly events, where we highlight materials from the collection and expose a new generation to the treasures housed at the JCB. Finally, as Bill and Matthew mentioned, we will be creating a new association of friends and fellows, and we hope that you will join us as we do. This meeting of the library's former fellows and its long-standing associates group constitutes an opportunity for us to take stock of our strengths and build upon them, kind of a double helix 
or a bicycle with two wheels. Obviously, we haven't worked out the metaphor quite yet, but we hope to do that. Um, the, uh, this evening in particular, as Bill said, represents the 72nd annual meeting of the Libraries Associates Group, a collective founded by Wilmarth Sheldon Lefty Lewis and John Nicholas Brown more than 70 years ago. For the first time ever, former and current fellows will be invited to participate in this new association of f friends and fellows, and we hope to solidify the scholarly network of the JCB in a more formal way, taking advantage of new developments in uh, information technology and social media so that fellows can keep track of their colleagues' scholarship, questions, and queries. Membership uh, in the new Association of Friends and Fellows will, uh, may uh, confer certain privileges as well. For instance, being able to move digital items uh, to, the, to the queue, or finding out about new acquisitions in precisely your own area of scholarly expertise. So these are only some of the directions that I imagine the library will be moving into in future years. And the Board of Governors and I count on your support encouragement and engagement as we do. Let me conclude with a brief anecdote and a conversation I had at the Morgan Library uh, last month. Not yet. I asked one of the curators there whether they liked to emphasize the history of the Morgan collection when they conduct exhibits and presentations. To be honest, this curator explained to me, no one really seems to care. Adding that it may be of interest to us but it really doesn't capture the imagination of the public in the same way. And I thought about this a lot as I was preparing a talk about the history of the collection of the John Carter Brown Library, I assure you. And if any of you feel the same way that she did after listening to my foray into the JCB's past and its future, I sincerely hope you will forgive me. My aim, however, in a sentence, has been to pose the question, how do we use the past to chart a course for its future. And my studied response after a year and a half on this job is with great caution. In the closing line of his history, Winship wrote that the aim of the John Carter Brown Library is to answer every question asked of it concerning anything pr printed before 1801 which in any way relates to America. He continued, only as it approaches to this ideal can it justify its permanent, independent existence. And he closes, within this field, the library means to be preeminent. The emphatic nature of Winship's description, its circumscribed clarity, and the library's ever ambitious approach to an extraordinarily idyllic goal has inspired this institution for the past 100 years and more and we move away from that focus statement at our peril. But the world is not the same as it was in 1915, or 1846 for that matter, and our own priorities need to readjust to those changing needs. As we seek continued justification for the permanent independent existence of the John Carter Brown Library in a digital and increasingly interconnected age, we should open those beautiful, if rather heavy doors, leading outside and converse not only with the world's greatest scholars in the, JCB field, in the JCB's fields, that is to say, those of you who are currently among us, but also with those who might rarely cross the library's threshold. Their ideas may help us to find our way not only with regard to the past, but also with respect to the future. We must not abandon the fundamental priorities set out by earlier visionaries like John Carter Brown or George Parker Winship. But a dogmatic attachment to how things were done before may get in the way of the past teaching us all of the important lessons we need to know, not to mention questions of the fu future we may not yet know to ask. On that note, let me hereby declare the first John Carter Brown Library Jamboree and meeting of the new Association of Friends and Fellows open, and to quote a well-known author that my almost two-year-old daughter would most certainly applaud, let the rumpus begin. Thank you. <laughs>